Mark Whitaker is entitled The Unjust Steward. And with that, I give you Brother Mark. You know, uh, brothers and sisters, at the, at the Russian Bible school, uh, because R Russians aren't quite as good as yourselves for, for getting into class in time, they have a brother who goes round with a bicycle horn and honks it five minutes before the start of each session to make sure everybody's in their place. Thank you for the idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting, waiting to see it fulfilled. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, back in the UK where we, we have television, tele is, yeah, okay, it's a little, little box thing, um, there was a, a famous advert shown on TV, apparently it dates back to 1986, this is a very, very fuzzy picture of it, uh, advertising the Guardian newspaper. Um, this, this, uh, this advert showed uh, what appeared to be um, a, a young man with a skinhead, um, what we'd kind of call it, we'd call him a chav today, I don't know what you'd, you'd call somebody like that. I don't know, okay. Um, and, and he, it, the, the camera is quite, quite close in on this young man. It's like the street view of him as he runs along the road and, and appears to attack a well-dressed businessman with a briefcase, uh, forcing him in, uh, off the street. Um, and you think, oh, this, uh, this guy's attacking a, a, another man. And, and then the camera pans back. And it shows what's actually happening, because what's actually happening that you can just about make out on the, on the screen there is that the young man, uh, the, the chav, has actually seen some falling masonry and runs along the street to push the businessman out of the, uh, out of the path of the, the falling masonry. And the whole, the whole point of the advert is that this newspaper gave you more than one perspective. It's about seeing things with a, with a different perspective because the point it was making was that what you saw from that very restricted close-up view, the woman on the street, was very different. It was the exact opposite of what was actually happening. Now, I tell you this story because it seems to me that in the, uh, the parable we're about to read, which is in Luke 16, if you can open your Bibles to that, please, that this parable is, is very similar in that it demands that we, we try and take a different perspective uh, to actually understand what Jesus is talking about. Because Luke 16 gives to you and me uh, what I think is probably the most challenging of the parables that Jesus teaches. Not, not challenging in that it challenges us as to how we behave, although it does, but challenging because we read it and think, I have no idea what the Lord Jesus is trying to tell us there. Because on the face of it, first glance, first read through of this parable, brothers and sisters, it seems to me that the Lord Jesus is promoting greed and dishonesty. Jesus is teaching greed and dishonesty. Let's have a look at what, it, what we read. Luke 16 and verse 1. He also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So we called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. The man was clearly a crook. You know, he'd been wasting his master's goods, and he was the man who had the job of looking after them and dealing responsibly with them. Um, in fact, it's the same phrase, wasting, that's used in the previous chapter about the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son, chapter 15, verse 13, gathered everything, went to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So that's, that's the kind of person this steward was, wasteful. Um, but in all, his, in all his dishonesty, he hadn't, uh, he hadn't enriched himself, he hadn't been stashing it away in a savings account, because in verse 3, he says within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. Yeah, he was ashamed to beg, but he wasn't so ashamed that he wasn't going to go on and swindle his master even more. 
because that's what he does, isn't it? Verse 4, I've resolved what to do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, and he says to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the, the steward, this is a manager, isn't it? He, he solves the problem caused by his dishonesty by being more dishonest. Because that's what he's doing, isn't it? He said, I'll tell you what, you know, just, just write a lower figure. I'll, I'll sign it off for you, and the master will be none the wiser. Of course, the master, uh, the master sees what's going on. Verse 8, so the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Now, I think that's quite a tough verse uh, that we've reached already here, brothers and sisters, because we're left with a conundrum here. You know, does is it that this, the master of this, this man, who knows what's been going on, that's why he's throwing him out, is it that he's been hoodwinked? that he's, he's been so completely deceived by this steward that he thinks that, uh, that he's a clever guy and he's done something really good. You know, well done. You've got, you know, you've found, you've put yourself back on your feet again. Is that, is that what's going on? He commends him. Well done for sorting your life out. Or is it more that he commends him? You know, that actually he's, he's not hoodwinked at all, that he knows exactly what's been going on in the background. He sees his shrewd behaviour here. Well, you can, you can see the way my mind's going, the way I've, I've pinned this man down. Well, if, if that's a difficult verse, because we've got, to, we've got to read a little bit between the lines, what about verse 9? Jesus says, And I say to you, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home. And this is the, the point, this is the verse, isn't it, that makes this parable such a difficult one for you and I to get our heads round. Because what's Jesus saying if this is, if this is the point of the parable, if this is the, the crux of it, if you read it on face value, like I just did, Jesus seems to be saying, use wealth, unrighteous mammon, or however it reads in your own version, uh, ungodly riches, I, I don't know. Use wealth to make friends so that, so that th th they'll support you when, when you need support. What? Really? <laughs> the Lord Jesus is saying... Use your money to make friends for yourself. Now, how, how does that stack alongside everything else we know about the Lord Jesus and his view of wealth and the pursuit of it and the use of it? Remember when the, the guy came to Jesus and said, hey, make my brother divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said, beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Jesus couldn't give two hoots about wealth and its division. Uh, or the rich young ruler who came to the Lord Jesus, and when, as he went away, Jesus said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Or, or in, in the, uh, the Sermon on the Flat Place that Jesus gives in Luke 6, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Woe to you who are rich, for you've received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. And, and he says later on, Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. You know, when you look at verses like that, brothers and sisters, you know, we get, an, we get a much better picture, don't we, of the focus of the Lord Jesus' teaching and the, the bad press which the, the well-off get and those who trust in their riches in, in the teaching of the Lord Jesus. So it, it makes, in the light of these sort of verses, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever for the Lord Jesus now in chapter 16 in the very same gospel 
to be saying to his disciples, use money to make friends. That's the way to go. Use money to make friends. There is another problem, of course, isn't there, in verse 9 here. It's in the second half of the verse. Because he says, when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now, I, I read in that, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, but, but when I hear the Lord Jesus talking about an everlasting home, I'm thinking he's talking about the only kind of everlasting home you would want to be received into, which is a place in God's kingdom. Okay, make friends using your wealth so that when you fail, those friends will be able to find you a place in God's kingdom. How does that work? That the friends we make through our money will bring us to God's kingdom. You, you see how, how, how crazy it sounds, brothers and sisters, when we, uh, when we start kind of reading it aloud like that and trying to, to think of what Jesus is saying. You know that, I know we say, you know, salvation isn't by works. This sounds like Jesus is teaching salvation by wealth. You know, if you make friends with money, that'll get you into the kingdom of God. No, 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 no. Now, some comment, uh, this, uh, any, any commentary you read, by the way, brothers and sisters, wrangles over this and says, what is this all about? So some commentators say, well, actually, verse 9 isn't, isn't the point of the parable. Uh, the point of the parable is verse 8, uh, and it's about the diligence that this man shows. Look how hard he works now to sort things out for himself. Jesus is actually teaching his disciples the need for diligence, like the people of this world, you know, works so hard to make things right for themselves. Well, you know, that's, you know, that is a good principle, isn't it? That, that, uh, that you and I should, in our lives, show the same level of diligence in the service of our master as people in the world show diligence in, in pursuing successful careers. But this is, a very, this is a very elaborate and detailed parable. This is brothers and sisters. And that comment in verse 8... Where, where Jesus says, you know, the sons of this world are more shrewd than the sons of the, uh, the, the, the sons of light. You know, that's, that's actually just a passing comment. Jesus hasn't even, he's not got to the crux of the parable yet. It seems to me that it doesn't wash that Jesus would make that the crux of the matter, because actually he's, he's not got to the real teaching that he wants to get over yet. So he, 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 yes, he throws in that principle, but that's, that's not what this parable is all about. At least it seems not to me. You know, you can you tell me I'm all wrong afterwards, that's fine. So, like the, uh, like the advert, this is where it seems that we need to try and get a different perspective on this parable. Um, and, and I've got a, a couple of different perspectives I want to share with you um, this morning. First of all, by trying to puzzle out what on earth uh, Jesus is, is talking about, because... Um, Verse 9. Well, what's, what's the real problem with this whole parable? It, it revolves around one word, or my, maybe in your version, one phrase. Verse 9, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. By unrighteous mammon, or by means of, or through. I don't know if anybody's got any other words than those, but it, it, that's, that's the, the, uh, the word there, isn't it? Um, ek, tiny little word in Greek, ek. And it does mean by, um, it means by means of, it means through. It comes hundreds of times in the New Testament. You imagine how good a word it is. And that's what it means. That's a very, very accurate translation. But it's not the only translation. I see I've given the game away already by injudicious use of the uh, PowerPoint. But um, that word also means out of. It also means away from. Those are also entirely correct ways to translate this word which is the exact opposite of the way we read it in our, in our English versions. Um, 
let me let me give you a, a few examples, if I may. Actually, uh, verse four in this same this same chapter. Uh, the, the, the steward says, I'm resolved what to do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. When I am put out of the stewardship, out of is the same word, ek. Um, let's think of another one. Uh, the end of Luke's Gospel, uh, Luke 23, verse 55, uh, at the burial of Jesus, the women who came with Jesus from Galilee into Judea, to Jerusalem, to the feast, came from Galilee. They came out of Galilee. That's Luke 23, verse 55. Um, or or in, in, in first, oh, I've got this one here, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 13, quite a grim reference here. Uh, Paul says, those who are outside God judges, therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. Talking about removing from fellowship with us. Away from, that's the Greek word, ek. And I could give you over 200 more occasions in the New Testament where the word is translated that way round. Now, don't ask me why the Greeks did this, why they would have a word that means both one thing and its exact opposite. That's, it's all Greek to me. But it does make a difference to you and me, doesn't it? Because as soon as we reread verse 9 and we say, okay, well, let's, let's use ek in that sense instead, then it makes a very different reading of it. Especially as well, when you, when, and I think probably most of your modern versions, I don't know what you're reading, uh, authorised version and the King James, uh, New King James tend to be the same. As soon as you get to things like ESV, NIV, um, it probably doesn't say when you fail, it probably says, in the middle of the verse, when it fails. Anybody got when it fails? Talking about the unrighteous mammon? Yeah? Okay, so let's, uh, let's try and reread it a little bit like that. Jesus says, I say to you, make friends for yourselves away from unrighteous mammon, so that when it fails, they may receive you into an everlasting home. You see, already I feel better about the parable. Because actually, it's making sense to me now. It doesn't, doesn't jar in my mind that the comment the Lord Jesus is making here in verse 9 is, don't be like the unjust steward. No, Jesus is saying, be quite the opposite to that man. He made friends for himself by, through, unrighteous mammon and, and his unrighteous use of wealth, and sure, his, his unrighteous use of, of wealth found him a home, didn't it? You know, people received him into their homes, but I guess that was never going to be a lasting home. That would only last as long as those people's goodwill lasted. The Lord Jesus says to his disciples, though, what I want you to do is I want you to make friends for yourselves away from unrighteous mammon. We'll come back to what unrighteous mammon is in a bit. Uh, because making friends away from this thing that's wrong will find you an everlasting home, that the home that God has prepared for you, the, the sort of everlasting home that we want when the temporary things of this life, unrighteous mammon, has, has, has failed at last. Now, that's all well and good. Uh, anybody feeling comfortable with that so far? I'm not even seeing any nods. Come on, give me a nod, even if it's just because you're waking up. Okay, so a degree of comfort. That's all very well, and I'm... I'm well, you can tell I'm happy with this, otherwise I wouldn't have gone through all of that. Um, I'm happy with that, but... Is, is that really what the parable is, is still all about? Is the Lord Jesus telling you this, this involved story about this man just so that at the end of it he can say, uh, don't be like that then? That's, that's a bit unusual, isn't it? To do all of that and just say, so don't be like him. Well, this is, I think, where... Um, this is where perspective helps. Again, here's the second perspective I'd like to bring to this. And this is, this is the stepping back like the camera, where by stepping back we see a much bigger picture. Because I don't know if you noticed, the start of chapter 16 
starts with with what words he also said to his disciples what does that tell you brothers and sisters this is carrying on isn't it this is the continuation of a conversation and the conversation starts at the beginning of chapter 15 chapter 15 starts with then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near him to hear him and the Pharisees and scribes complained saying this man receives sinners and eats with them and what does Jesus do? Jesus spends chapter 15 now telling three parables to explain to the scribes and the Pharisees exactly why he eats with sinners. And you know the parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Those are the three parables Jesus teaches. This is why I eat with sinners, because I've come to save sinners. I've come to find those who are lost. And chapter 16 carries on. He also said, and what Jesus is going to do now, brothers and sisters, is he's going to now contrast the lost who have been found with those who thought they were found and were saved, but in reality were condemned. They were the lost. Actually, the, the transition starts in chapter 15, doesn't it? Because you know the, the, the parable of the lost son, it starts with one son who's lost, doesn't it? But it ends with another son who's lost. You know the elder, the elder brother? He's the one who's lost really, isn't he, when we get to the end? And, and from that point, the one who was all goody-goody two-shoes, I've never transgressed any of your commandments, we go, we go on into chapter 16 where actually Jesus says, oh, you really have, you really have been wasting my goods, actually. Let's, uh, let's think about this then, because what we see is that, the, is that chapter 16, in fact the whole of chapter 16, because there's another difficult parable as well in this chapter, isn't there? The rich man and Lazarus. Chapter 16 is all about the other lost, the ones who thought they'd been saved. It's the scribes and the Pharisees, first of all, here. So, here we go. Verse 1 again. He said also to his disciples, there was a certain rich man, who had a steward. And the rich man, the rich man's going to be God, isn't it, brothers and sisters? He's, he's the one who's the rich, the ruler, the master, the king. It's always God. He had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. And these are the religious leaders. Je Jesus is pinpointing these people. These were the people who'd taken on themselves the responsibility for administering the, the, the riches that God had given to his people, all God's laws uh, and, and all the, the worship of God. They'd taken that responsibility. They were, if you like, God's managers. And they were accused of wasting, wasting God's riches. And they had been accused, hadn't they? In fact, even before Jesus was on the scene, here was the accusation. John the Baptist stood up. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God's able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Yeah, jo John had already, he'd already put the axe at the root of those particular trees. He'd serve notice on them. He'd made the accusation that these men were wasting God's goods. And so they were going to be rejected. And it's the Lord Jesus, isn't it, who, who issues, if you like, the final rejection. As verse 2 says, the rich man calls him and says to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. And, you know, the, they, those men, they knew... Actually, when the Lord Jesus came along, it was very clear, wasn't it, that their days were numbered. What was the pharisaical approach then to, to God's notice to them that they were to be rejected as, as the managers of, of the, the riches of God's, God's ways? 
verse 3. What shall I do? For my master's taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. These men were not going to stoop to do honest work, were they? <laughs> Nor were they going to, uh, to set about trying to make things right with God. They could have done that, couldn't they? They could have said, well, actually, let's try and, and put things right with God. But they don't. What they do, what the steward does, is he sets about making himself popular with his master's debtors. Think of what Jesus is saying here. These men in his age, about to be rejected by God, that their solution is to make themselves popular with those who owe a debt to God. Well, that's everybody, isn't it? Everybody else in the Jewish nation owed a debt of service to God. And so the Pharisees' approach was, let's retain popularity with the people because they pay the bills. And it's true, isn't it? They, you know, that was, that was what, all that money going into the temple treasury, that's what kept them going. So, verse 5, of course, he calls every one of his master's debtors to him and says to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Now, I think that's quite interesting because, because in many ways, when we look at the scribes and the Pharisees, we think, oh, you know, they laid burdens heavy to be borne on people's shoulders. That's what the Lord Jesus says about them, isn't it, in Matthew 23? And they did. They, they made the law really cumbersome and onerous to men and women to keep. But they also made themselves popular, incredibly, by finding workarounds to God's laws where it suited them and where it suited other men and women. You know, if there was something that would keep them in favour with the people, they would, they would do it. And do you know what? Jesus immediately quotes an example of that in this chapter. Between the two parables, there's one little verse, verse 18, and it just pops out there on its own. Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. And that verse seems to, it's like, whoa, where's that come from? But, but re remember from Matthew 19, that whole thing of divorce and remarriage was a massive issue, wasn't it, in the Jewish nation? Do you remember that the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, you know, can, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Because that's what they'd been working on. You know, what, you know, what, what, can, we, what can we do that will, will make us popular with people? Let's, let's try and, let, you know, the Lord Jesus said, you know, apart from, from, from where there's been immor immoral behaviour, but they, they'd whittled it down, hadn't they, to, you know, if she burns the toast, that's okay. Any reason. I didn't look like how she looked this morning. Any reason. And, and Jesus drops it in there. He doesn't, you haven't got the explanation here. But that's one of the things they did. Because that, that would make them popular with, with how many people in the nation, do you think? There's another better example, of course. Uh, turn to it, if you will, please, in, in, uh, keep a finger in Luke. Turn to it in Mark's Gospel, chapter 7. This is probably the one you thought I was going to go to, uh, to first of all. Mark 7 and verse 9. Jesus said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honour your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down, and many such things you do. So, so here, here they were, they, they, they got this work around for people, you know, there was a Brian and Laura saying, you know, we don't really want Curtis and Pat to come and live with us. So uh, they said, look, Curtis uh, and Pat, I'm really sorry, we've, um, we've actually promised to God all the money we would have put aside to building the extension on the house for you to live in. So I'm sorry, you know, you're going to have to, well, just do, do what you can. 
that's, that's what the Pharisees had said. You know, if you, if you committed your, your, your inheritance uh, to, 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 to God, to the temple, you could then say to your, your elderly parents, we've, uh, we've set that aside. We, we so love to help you, but we've promised it to God. But notice the point Jesus makes at the end. Many such things you do. This is one isolated example of where they had whittled down God. This was one of the Ten Commandments. And they turned the Ten Commandments around into something that people could get. They could work their way around. They could work their way around. This is the... Uh, this is the debt reduction which the scribes and the Pharisees had achieved. Sit down quickly and write 50 or 80. And, and it's when, when we begin to see what Jesus is getting at here that these men who, who were entrusted with such, such, such important and valuable things as the Ten Commandments and how men and women kept them, you know, they, they whittled it down to something that, you know, with a bit of money and a bit of cleverness, you know, and a bit of greasing of palms, you could work your way around. It makes you and me realise, brothers and sisters, that this whole parable is nothing to do with money, is it? Just as the parable of the sower is not about farming, this parable isn't about whether we what, what we do with our money at all. This is one of those. Remember I said yesterday the Pharisees never got, they actually never got any of the parables Jesus taught. Well, this is one of them that they don't. Because verse 14, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard these things and derided him. You know, they, they thought this story was actually about money. It's not about money. It's about, well, let's think, what is this? Uh, what is this unrighteous mammon, this, this ungodly riches that Jesus is talking about? Well, this whole parable is about how these men had dealt with the responsibility given to them by God. God had entrusted them with his riches, not money, his laws, his covenant through Moses. Now, you might, you might say... Um, you know, why, why is it unrighteous then? Why, why, how come it's ungodly? Well, they've made it ungodly, haven't they? They turned the riches of God into unrighteous mammon. They distorted it and, uh, and perverted it. So, so tragic. And actually that leads us to realise, as we carry on through, that this parable, not only is it not about money, but that the moral, the, the real teaching of this parable is not verse 9 either. Because <laughs> verse 9 is also a point in passing that the Lord Jesus is making. He's saying, this is the way these people make their friends, through their distortion of God's laws, through their, their, the way they treat unrighteous mammon. Don't you do that. You need to make, if you're going to make friends, make friends in, in the right way. Through, through the judicious use of the wealth of, of God's riches. The actual moral of the parables, verse 10 and 11, isn't it? He who's faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches. And the, the point that Jesus is making there in those verses is that when, when God looked at the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he saw men who were willing to play fast and loose with God's laws, with, with the riches that, that God had given to his people. They were, they were unfaithful in what was least, the law of Moses. So it was inevitable that God was never going to trust to them his, his greatest riches of all, the, the new covenant and the hope of the kingdom that we have. You know, they, were going, they weren't going to find an everlasting home, were they, in, in the kingdom of God? They were never going to be granted the greater responsibility that comes for those who will see the, the age to come. As verse 12 says, if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? 
That, that makes me think of the parable of the talents, brothers and sisters. Remember, those who were faithful in, in another man's, you've been faithful in little, were given their own. I'll make you ruler over ten cities. You see, how lovely, isn't it, the way the parables of, of the Lord Jesus tie together in, in this way. You know, the, the, the true riches, what is our own? That, that's, that's the covenant, the new covenant that you and I are part of, that we should value. And it's a place in God's kingdom that we look forward to. And this, this really brings me final, finally, and I've got ten minutes, um, to... The lesson for you and me, brothers and sisters, um, I, I, I hope you found this, this at least interesting so far, whether you agree with it or not. Um, but up till now, you know, we can look at this and we can say, oh, that's very nice. So I kind of I get the perspective now. But this, that's so academic, isn't it? If we just stop there and say, oh, here's Jesus having a pop at the leaders of his day. Well, that doesn't do you and I any good whatsoever, other than maybe in headspace. But of course, the principle is there at the end of the parable, isn't it, that you and I can take to ourselves. Verse 10, he or she who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? You know, the, the thing about you and me, brothers and sisters, is God has already entrusted to you and me something far more valuable than what those men had. They had the law of Moses. You and I have the gospel message. We've been entrusted with, with something so much more valuable. The gospel message that we've heard, we've believed, we've been baptised into. We've taken hold on, on that hope. And, and, and through that, we have a responsibility as well, don't we, to keep and to teach and to share a much higher standard of living as well. You know, if you and I were under the law... We could just be ticking off every day the laws we were keeping and telling ourselves what good folks we were. But it's not like that, is it, with the law of Christ? That for you and me, we, we have principles, not rules. We have a, a law to live that, that requires thought and, and real application in our lives. And yet it's so easy for you and me, with the high standards of the law of Christ... To, to whittle them down and to say, well, do you know what? Let's, let's make that a bit easier. Why, why would we do that? Why would we make, make the, the laws of Christ and the true riches of the gospel of the kingdom, why would we whittle that down to be, to be more popular with our brothers and sisters, to be more popular with the society around us, maybe? You know, maybe, maybe we're tempted to, to cut corners on, on the morality front. You know, there's, there's some tough stuff, isn't there, in the New Testament? And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to Corinthians, says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You know, that's, uh, that, that's, that's part of the law of Christ, isn't it, uh, that Paul wraps up there. But it's not a very nice message, is it? It's not a nice message, not in our society today. You know, we might say, well, you know, God says that stuff, but, you know, surely if, if two people love one another very much, you know, surely that, that's far more important than keeping the exacting laws of God that says, well, it's got to be a, a man and a woman rather than two men or, or two women together. You know, why, you know why, why do we have to do that? Can't we just, can't we just go with, uh, with the fact people love each other? I don't know what it's like over here, brothers and sisters, but back in the UK, the, the kind of the, the, the complaint you hear uh, um, on and off is, you know, our young people, they don't, they don't come into the, uh, into the truth anymore because we, we, we've not moved with the times. You know, our, we're, we're, we're still mired in, in, in some of the doctrines that we should, have, we should have put to one side or practices that we don't need to keep anymore. You know, what, what, why, 
what are we still doing reading and believing Genesis? You know, why, why, are, we, why are we doing that stuff? It's, it's, you know it's driving our young people away. So it, that's, that's something, you know, we, we, should, we shouldn't insist on this stuff. We shouldn't make it such a cornerstone of our faith. And, and it's easy, isn't it, brothers and sisters, to whittle, to whittle away at, at some, of, some very big blocks of stone, but which are yet the cornerstone of, of our faith. Because cause it makes us appear more popular, doesn't it? It puts us more in line with, with our society, because we all want that, uh, don't we, in our lives. So, you know, there's a warning there, brothers and sisters, that the Lord Jesus is, is firing fair and square at the leaders of, of his own nation. You know, he, the way this whole couple of chapters works, he's having a go at the scribes and the Pharisees. But you and I, we too need to consider the, the principle that the Lord Jesus is getting over here for ourselves as well. He who is faithful in what is least, you know, the smallest matters of doctrine or practice that we are taught by the Lord Jesus and his apostles. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in, in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. It's really important, isn't it? Says the Lord Jesus to you and me today that we prove ourselves to be faithful in, in the greatest and the least things of, of those that, that God has entrusted to us in, in this life now. You know, that we shouldn't squander the gospel message, that, you know, what you believed, what you held on to when you were baptised into Christ, because you saw that was the only lifeline to salvation. Don't, don't let it go. Don't, don't thin it down or distort it or, or chip bits off it when you're sharing it with others today. But, you know, because we owe it, don't we? We owe it to the next generation. We owe it to those men and women that we come into contact with. For, 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 for us, for us, it's thousands of Iranians who have... <laughs> They've come through hell to, to get to the, uh, the green and leafy shores of the UK. Not because they're green and leafy, but because they, they want to hear the gospel message. And we owe it to them to teach them the gospel message as it is. Not as our society would like us to make it. You know, so faithful stewardship is really important. I just want to close with some, some words of the Apostle Paul. You know, the, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, before some of the tough stuff he says, he, he makes a point about himself and Barnabas. Uh, and he could almost have been reading this parable of the Lord Jesus here. Because, and i leave you with these words. He says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. We manage the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. We had one job, didn't we? So uh, let's do it, brothers and sisters.